So, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to continue with the afternoon session. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Helga Eichelmann. I'm from the University of Mainz, and I'm going to be the chairman of this very interesting input we are going to have from uh, the respected guests on the afternoon session. Um, the first I would like to introduce is Professor Ulrike Giraud. She is uh, the founder and director of the European Democracy Lab, which is an institution by the European School of Governance in Berlin. And uh, she's also professor of European politics at the Danube University in Krems, Austria. Um, she has held numerous positions on European relations and European integration. Just one to point out is she was a former senior fellow at uh, European Council on Foreign Relations and published on European integration, especially uh, in the question of further integration and the financial crisis. So the basic question you are going to raise today, what is democracy today? Very interesting. Professor Gold, you have the audience. So um, many thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, I think I will not be able to answer the sort of overall question, what is democracy today, because it's probably too big. And we heard a lot of interesting talks already. Um, I point out to um, Michael Schäfer, who gave an excellent overview about today's assessment uh, of what democracy is, Colin Crouch, post-democracy, and all of this. So you will find a little bit of this also in my presentation. But I will be focused on Europe, because I'm European, I'm dealing with European integration, and my basic research instincts are to analyze why European integration has been flawed and in difference to some of the things we saw this morning, I will be a little less theoretical, I will do a little bit more of political economy, trying to explain why that populism thing could happen in Europe. And um, I start with an artwork which I picked up in Paris, it's from a Modelvian artist and I like it really much because it uh, pulls together two words, crying and crisis, so we cry about a crisis, but we do not really know about which crisis we cry, is there a Euro crisis, a debt crisis, a populism crisis, a nationalism crisis, so all this just makes us cry because we feel that malaise politique all over the place and we don't sort of, ca we, we cannot really grasp it. So there is another artwork of the same um, artist, which I loved even more, and which tells us that perhaps what we are stumbling with um, or struggling with is that thing called nation or nation state, and perhaps it might be just a hallucination, that nation state, because we clinch to a fictive concept of what a nation is, um, although perhaps in uh, globalized economies it might be more of a hallucination than um, a nation. So. Uh, that was the art word. I had the enormous chance in my life to work for Jacques Delors, who once said, you cannot fall in love with a single market, Europe needs a soul. And I think what we are stumbling today about is that we indeed cannot fall into love in a uh, single market in Europe, and people are fed up with markets, they are fed up with growth <coughs> concepts, they are fed up with um, neoliberalism, and this is also what drives Europe um, apart. So, uh, going back a little bit to theory, I picked up that last work from Jürgen Habermas, I think he's familiar to you, and Habermas um, wrote that book in April 2015, where he basically argues, and I will be very quick about this, is that what we did with the Maastricht Treaty in 92 is we disentangled state and market. We put markets and uh, currency on the European level, we left uh, distributionary politics and social politics on the national level, and the two cannot function disentangled. So we need to put together state and market. Um, either we skip the euro, that mm -hmm. is the one option. If we do not want to skip the euro because we think that the euro carries our prosperity, we should embed the euro into something which is called a post-national democracy. That's the concept of positive integration, which would be democracy beyond nation states, and that is what Europe never got to. And that, I think, is the essential problem, and many of the things have already been sketched out this morning. So now, if you read that chart, uh, it's sort of uh, what is the support structure for United States of Europe. And you can see in the uh, dark blue, which is 35% in Germany, 13 in the UK, and 44 in France, of people who are still supporting the concept of United States of Europe. If these are the three big member states in Europe, there's basically no more support for what we once called United, Sta United, uh, United States of Europe or the concept of ever closer union, 
I skipped the data for the smaller countries, but essentially in the three big countries, nation states of the European Union, the concept of United States of Europe does no longer fly. <coughs> Um, it's very easy to see why, because what we did in the so-called European Trilogy, which is the system of the European institutions, we created um, a parliament with no right of legal initiative, we created a commission which is set to be the guardian of the treaties, but normally that's what a European court should do, and we have a national council, the European Council, which basically torpedoes everything um, on, um, on behalf of national cards which are played in the European Council. So what we created in essence is a governance system, but Governance is ownership for everybody and responsibility for none. This is a very nice sort of way that the European Union does politics. We don't have government, we don't have accountability, we don't have input legitimacy, we only have governance, nobody is ever responsible, and that is what flaws the European system. So what we do have is there's no real opposition in the European Parliament because the trilogy works that the European Parliament to outward the European Council always needs to have a two-third majority to go against the Council, but this avoids politicization of the European Parliament because you always need 70% which means that you have an basically a structural uh, grand coalition in the European Parliament which never can do politics. You cannot outward these people, you don't have an opposition, and this is essentially what is called the democratic deficit of the European Union. So now, you do not need to be a political scientist and trained in knowing this. If you are just an ordinary citizen like my mother, you don't understand these things, but you still have the feeling, what I want is not done. Or I most of the time want different things, and it's never done, it's never delivered, and if I'm unhappy, I cannot outward the system. So, and that is basically why we ended up in a political class who defends that European trilogy, calling it sui generis, which is basically um, the... Um, a very good reason to not explain the system, because if it's sui generis, what we created in the European <laughs> Union, there's no need to explain. But still, I think it's pretty much, I apologize the world, bullshit. Um, so, Thomas Piketty, I guess you all know, once said in a Spiegel interview, we have created a monster, so I brought you a monster to basically um, demonstrate um, the times in which we are living in um, European um, integration setting. And uh, from there, we do a little bit of political economy because that's at the origins, I would argue, of today's populism and nationalism. It has been mentioned uh, already a couple of times, but here are some data. The chart is very easy to read. What you read is what is violent, vi violet is good, and if you're not violet, you're not good. Um, the thing is that the structural divisions are not about nation states, but they are about rural, urban, and center periphery. <laughs> Not everybody in Germany is export champion. You see the east of Germany is far from being export champion, but because the east Germans can feel into the German sort of export champion narrative, they can believe that they are really good, although they are not good. But for instance, Slovenia, northern Italy or Austria in the German sort of body um, uh, of export championship of the clusters of European industry. So um, uh, the, 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 the reading of the chart here is that what determines whether you are good or not good in terms of economy in Europe does not depend on your nation state and does not depend on your national economy, but it depends on whether you are center periphery or you are rural and urban. So you can see Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Ireland, Dublin, uh, Helsinki, there are a couple of bubbles, but it's basically not that the, or in France, you know, Ile de France, I will come to France a little bit later, but the thing is that within the European Union, we still drive all politics in national competition, which is what Ulrich Beck once called the national methodology and the national containers, which is we do as if we have national economies and we aggregate data in a national setting, although if you look at that chart, it does not mirror political social reality in Europe and I think this is the biggest flip of um, European integration. Coming to France, it's very easy because uh, most uh, EU economists will tell you that France needs structural reforms and that France has an overall unemployment of 10% aggregated. And my point here is even though 10% of unemployment might be true for the whole of France, it just tells you nothing. The red chart shows you um, unemployment in red and the vote of Front National is in black. What this chart maps out is that wherever, if you know a little bit of France, most of the regions in dark are rural areas. So 10% of aggregated data for France tells, doesn't tell you a thing because what it tells you is if you are rural, then you have a high chance to be unemployed and if you are unemployed, then you go voting Marine Le Pen. 
these data, the connex between rural unemployment and populist vote, is an evident character, an evident systemic thing across the European Union. I can give you charts for Finland, for Sweden, for the UKIP vote, which is all that. Rural means unemployed, means populist, or the tendency. So. Um, if we see this, that's the next, that these are the results of the last regional elections in France, pointing to the same thing, which is basically that Marine Le Pen is not showing her real political impact just because we have majoritarian voting system in France, which is first past the first. We do not have a proportional voting system. <laughs> but, and so she is not yet represented in Parliament a lot, right, the Front National. But if we were to have proportional voting systems in France, as we do have in Germany, Marine Le Pen would score like Franz Josef Strauss in the best times of Bavarian sort of government. And this is the danger we do not see just because of her electoral mechanisms. The same chart here, I just brought you the regional elections chart. We go for um, Austria. This is Mr. Hofer, who we may welcome as the new um, Austrian president. We do not know. But uh, it's pretty much the same thing. He's beyond 30%. Be reminded that 30% is um, uh, very crucial because if you go with Stieglitz, who always says in a more cynical way, you can always lose 20% of your population, but you never can lose 30% because the 70% react to the 30%. So it's in, if you want so, is a cynical argument, but there's something about the Gini coefficient, which is that if the Gini coefficient between equality, total equality, and total inequality goes beyond 30, it gets a past dependency, you cannot get the spirit <laughs> back to the bottle and there's something sort of um, petrified uh, systemic uh, uh, beyond 30. So Germany for instance lost the Gini uh, developed from 25 percentage points to 29 only in the fa past five years so you could make the case that European populism wasn't that much of a problem as long as it stayed around a fifth Huh? Because a fifth you can cynically always sort of lose, but you never lose 30%. The moment you lose 30%, your political system is in danger just because the 70 react to the 30. And that's what's happening when uh, the CDU now wants to basically double um, AfD by the right, or when Sarkozy basically tries to uh, conquer Marine Le Pen, doubling her at the right side, um, and the th same for Hofer. I give you just that chart for the UKIP and the Brexit decision, which is forthcoming. And on this XY chart, what you see is that basically London, which is sort of wealthy over there, um, in difference to the northeast and the more rural areas of the UK, mm -hmm. meaning that still, in relative terms, the rural areas of the UK are more dependent on the single market and on trade relations than London is. Read here, the London city will survive whether there's a Brexit or none. But a Brexit would deeply damage the rural areas of the whole UK. So if Cameron chooses Brexit or he will lose the vote, then basically he's torpedoing the public good for the UK as country and giving into interest of the city. This is obviously not combinable with everything we understand from what a statesman should do, which is caring for the whole country and not for a bunch of investment bankers living in London. Um, so I'm coming up with sort of um, another concept. We are talking, the, the, the topic here is what is democracy uh, today? And um, it has been mentioned by Michael Schäfer, but let's remind that in the sense of Aristoteles in his third book, democracy is a flawed concept and can always turn into tyranny. Democracy, if you say that it's a, a majoritarian voting, the, the majority of the street is no democracy. So democracy as such, if we only measure by majority, this does not mean uh, necessarily that we have a democracy. So this is why ancient writers, from Platon to Aristoteles to Cicero to Kant Rousseau, always talked not about democracy. They talked about the republic. The republic. So I brought you the picture of Honoré Dumier, painted in 1848, very interesting period in uh, European history. And here you meet she. She is the republic. And what she does is she feeds her citizens with two big breasts. So understand that a formal, a hollowed out concept of democracy is not what we want, but what we want is a republic which basically nourishes the public good, res publica is the public good for the citizens. So what is democracy today? Perhaps that we forgot about the republic. If you read the Federalist Papers of the US, you will find in the Federalist Papers that the US by then always talked about <coughs> republican and not about democracy because Hamilton knew that democracy is a flawed concept. 
you know that uh, Socrates was killed by the mob, huh? just to give you this one. Now, if we want to move out of this sort of what is democracy today, um, we should think again about political union. Obviously, that was the concept of ever closer union, Maastricht Treaty, and we knew that the political union should be a transnational concept. By the way, all the writings of Jean Monnet and Walter Hallstein talked about that European project as such is overcoming the nation state. And we have bluntly forgotten that single sentence, which is European integration is overcoming the nation state and building a transnational democracy. So if you want to build a transnational democracy, what do you need? What you essentially need is in the political entity you are embarking in is that the citizens are equal. That is what Cicero called equium use, same law for everybody. Without citizens being equal in a political project, you cannot have a political entity. And this is the biggest flaw, in my opinion, of the European Union. Because what the European Union does not offer is equality for political equality. I have two sons who live in Paris, different income tax, different access to social rights. They vote our common parliament, which is the European Parliament, in a very different setting than I. So we do not offer, in a republican sense, res publica, the organization of the public good. In, in the EU system, we do not offer equality for citizens. So. Um, what we should do is basically think in more revolutionary terms. There are a lot of books written about European revolution these days, by the way. Peaceful, obviously. Europe has a nice experience of a peaceful revolution in 89. Uh, but here, what brought, what brought the French Revolution in 1789? It brought equality beyond classes. So today's claim, what we should claim for, if ever there's a chance for a democracy in Europe, is that the European Revolution in the 21st century should bring equality beyond nations which is the conditio sine qua non for building a political entity on this continent. So now, what do I mean with principle of political equality? Obviously, I'm not Marxist. I'm not arguing egalitarianism. I'm not arguing a basic income and every 800 euros for everybody. But what I'm arguing is that you need voting equality, which is one person, one vote. You need tax equality, Cicero's equium use, and equality in front of the law. And you need the same access to social rights if we want to organize the res publica europea, which is we want to organize the public good in Europe. So we don't do any of this. This is why Europe is basically screwed. And um, yeah, I don't know when it will collapse. But um, going through a couple of features more, um, we have a pretty hollowed out democracy. And this has been mentioned already this morning in numerous times. But we have a very formal understanding of democracy, which is that we uh, have majority sort of systems. And who has the majority um, is democratic. But I remember, uh, or I remind, majority uh, of the street is no democracy. If you were to argue that way, then you would easily admit that the Nazis were the best uh, Volksdemokratie in Germany that Germany ever had. And I guess we agree in this room that this was essentially not the case. So that is why we have that call for plebiscite in Europe. <laughs> And um, I think it's a wrong call, because all the writers from Rousseau uh, uh, onwards made a distinct differentiation between volonté de tous and volonté générale. So the volonté générale is held by a representative democracy and not by the terror of the street. So my argument is that we call today in Europe, all over the place, Mr. Hofer, Marine Le Pen, AfD, they call for participation and transparency because they, they feel that the system is corrupt. So, but then, is the answer participation and transparency, or is the answer to a corrupt system, is that participation the sense of plebiscite? I would argue no. The real answer should be fix the system. I happen to be part of the dear movement of Yanis Varoufakis. I picked a true fight with Yanis because Yanis Varoufakis on that dear meeting in Berlin Volksbühne said we need to conquer the street. And I said, Yanis, please, the left never conquered the street. The progressive never did. After French Revolution came Robespierre. The um, Moscow intellectuals screwed it up in, nine, in 1905. Even Sartre stood uh, in front of the factories and couldn't make an argument to the workers of Renault. So please, let's not conquer the street, but let's fix the system. And the fix the system is that what we are struggling is that we do have in all Europe basically the dichotomy between an opening versus a closure agenda. 
and uh, the closure agenda is Marine Le Pen and UKIP and sort of the populist argument is an agenda of closing, uh, closing liberalism but closing also refugees and the humanitarian agenda. But here comes the thing. The problem is that liberalism cannot be separated. The one side of liberalism always gets the other. What I mean is if you are right wing and you pledge for economic liberalism, you always get the sort of value liberalism which means gay, lesbians, uh, migrants, uh, cosmopolitanism with it. You you cannot have just the bit of piece of an economic liberalism, you need the opening of value liberalism too, and that is what makes the right suffer, because they essentially want only economic liberalism, but they never want the value liberalism. But it also makes the left suffer, because the left wants the closure of the economic, the liberal economism, but they want the value opening, right? But the two belong together, that is what Jacques Ronquière uh, calls the, the la haine de la démocratie, which is the, these two um, sides of liberalism always go back Packing, they always come along together, which makes the right and the left suffer, the, the moderate right and the moderate left suffer, and because that is so, they go into the extremes. Then the other structural problem seems to me that what you have today, I'm observing this sort of quite neatly, is that the left, the progressives, cannot bundle. We have all these movements out there like Attack the 99, Ed Ignatius, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, whoever. We all want something like, you know, more democracy, more social and so, but we do not have a clear goal. The goal should be, I mentioned it, the goal should be political equality, but nobody picked up this goal so far. But the left has no positive goals to claim for, and this is why the sort of progressive people in Europe cannot bundle, but the sort of uh, right-wing populists can get the votes just because we are still path dependently <laughs> operating in national systems, and at the end of the day what counts is your majority in the voting system, which is still national. So. The second flaw we have is a total asymmetry of lawmaking in the European Union. We have a system which is basically legal but not legitimate. You do not, know, you do, you do not need to know the, 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 the details of TTIP, but what it is is basically the global elites are negotiate, negotiating things which are definitely not good for the res publica, the common good of people in Europe. Um, so we have a huge amount of lobbying, stakeholder meetings and so on in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels. It's all legal, better regulation and all this stuff, but it's not legitimate because the system dramatically lets input, lacks input legitimacy. The problem here is that obviously the leads have an advantage, they all speak English, they can do all these stakeholder meetings in the Brussels couloirs, but citizens cannot. And that is why you could not get the Greek harbor voter, uh, harbor worker, together with the German lady who is also has been oppressed by the banking crisis, and they could not basically bundle together and claim for their rights because citizens are disadvantaged and the transnational sort of emerging uh, of citizens' rights for language reasons, for um, reasons of not getting control connected for reasons, for reasons not having the, the same ed education just does not function. But the real flaw of what we lived through during the Euro crisis was definitely that we had an elite system which had close to no more moral binding in the system, which is why we ended up socializing bank debts and we gave it to the burden of the public, um, which is what Jean-Luc Michel calls in his brilliant book, The Lack of Common Decency. And I give you a quote which I read in that super book of 13 bankers who left the system in New York in 2012. We knew it was legal, but it not moral what we did. And I think that is the statement of a system which basically declared him the, the, the system basically uh, uh, get, got, got bankrupt or, to say it very <laughs> bluntly, violated the public good through a very heavy neoliberal agenda. So, neglecting the public good has a price. If you don't hold, in the Rousseau's term, if you don't hold uh, volonté générale, you get volonté de tous, which is you vote with the feet, people end up voting with the feet. I give you just a couple of uh, um, uh, uh, figures here. Neglecting the public, public good means that the poorer end of German society in this case is 78% of the so-called Hartz IV recipient do no longer go to vote just because they do not think that ever if they vote, they would change the system to their better. So this is giving up on basically the lower quintile of the society. It happened in France, it happens in Germany. And we do have, and that has been mentioned I think already this morning, we do have inbuilt systemic flaws, which is a lack of education. We completely 
completely forgot about education. We are no longer offering uh, equality of chances. Um, we, uh, we are no longer pricing this in. And we do have, and that's the big book of Richard Sennett, I guess you, fall, you read it, The Fall of Public Men. We do no longer have the ambition that there needs to be something like a res publica, like a common good which needs to be organized. And we build up dis discourses about self-entrepreneurship and so on and so forth, which means that if you fail, you fail because you're not smart enough, but you never fail because your conditions weren't good. And this is basically systemic today, and this is inbuilt, which is why we lost at least 20 today, probably more 30 percent, and that is the, the origins of, um, uh, of the populism and the renationalization discourse. So in one word, I, as a German, I can say this, but um, I think it's the total mismanagement, especially of the German government throughout the Euro crisis, which was not oriented in the public good, which didn't hold the promise which we gave, we as German country, that German uh, unification and European integration belong together. We never made that work. We created a government system in which f we, we forgot about the rest of Europe, and the price we pay is that we basically exported the nationalism and the populism that we had in the big depression of the 30s in our own country. So now, how to get out there? You have now realized that I'm getting ever more uh, say beyond progressive, but even in terms of uh, revolutionary um, uh, vocabulary. But there's a huge literature out today about emancipatory processes, and the book I'm currently reading is The Art of Revolt of a French uh, young philosopher called uh, uh, Geoffrey de la Sangerie. So the real question is how can, yeah, it's there, how can we get an emancipatory process out of this, which is basically bringing back the primacy of politics, which is the essence, it has been mentioned, rule of law. Be reminded that in the legal interpretation, rule of law is nothing else than the modern translation of res publica, which is the moral binding of the law in the sense that um, the law always needs to be good and the law always needs to have a moral component. So if you want all our discourse about rule of law, which we are now trying to to get to the polls and to Orban and also that he, they do no longer hold rule of law and we are so shocked because they have a majority, how can they do this, is basically that we forget the concept of res publica, the modern translation rule of law. Um, now, you, let's do a little sort of case study and an example. Assange, Snowden, Manning, yeah, are the people who are these so-called whistleblowers, and they are oppressed by the systems. You know that Manning has been arrested in the U.S. under awful uh, conditions. Snowden is in Russia. Assange is uh, uh, in prison in this uh, British embassy. So, but here is a very conceptual question. Why does a so-called liberal state, the United States or Sweden or the U.K., need to oppress whistleblowers if they point to the fact that their states committed crime? because the state would go for control in a way that we never thought the liberal state would control us. Because the initial concept of a liberal state is that you have a privacy and a privacy sphere for you. So the concept of a modern state is the protection by the state of your privacy sphere. And the, <laughs> the concept is not that the so-called liberal state has the right to basically control you in your privacy sphere. And how could this function and what does this mean for a new challenging relationship between state citizens in international context, I think is the question of today because what we are talking here is that we are giving up individual freedoms to allow the states having privileged information and to allow the states that they tell us they need this privileged in information to protect us. And these are all these uh, discourses which are now uh, incinated, which is discourse on terror. You have a bomb. I mean, I know that you in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, you have many bombs. But if we have one bomb in Paris, then we already do a war against terror. And then we um, claim for security. And what we tell people is now you need to be more oppressed. And now we need to have more data control to protect you against terror. And that is why we are wiping off your individual freedoms. So I think there's a complete perversion of what the liberal state today should do. And because that completely complete conversion basically eats in our privacy sphere, I think it's a very fundamental question. And then you go back to Kant's Drittem Definitivsatz, which says that states always want to increase power, but citizens don't. So if we can deconstruct that citizens are not the state and that citizens may want different things than states, let alone that states do not need to be structured around a nation or an ethnic nation, then perhaps we come closer to a, a solution, and that's my last chart. I would argue the system is broken. I quote Hannah Arendt, financial concentration leads to power concentration, leads to war. We can define modern definitions of war. 
Thomas Piketty has the, sits, uh, has the figures uh, that we are basically in terms of income spreads as we were in 1913. So what democracy today is, is really striving to embed the process of globalization. And we, we should start in Europe, because in Europe, in the Eurozone, at least we are advanced. But we should strive for re-invirogate re a, think a republican thinking which is oriented to the global commons and to a commonwealth which is structuring at least the eurozone governance for a start into an embedded post-national democracy in Europe. But this you can only do if you deconstruct the concept of a nation state as the natural holder of the sovereignty which is evident because states are never sovereign, only citizens are, and in which uh, level of emancipation, we organize the public good, is basically the task of history. So if we could come to embedding the Euro governance into a civic concept of civic patriotism for a civic post-national democracy in Europe, I think we have a chance to win. If we do that peaceful revolution, where would we end up with, if you think that thought to the end, we would no longer end up in the United States of Europe, but obviously we would end up in what I call the European Republic, and that is why I just wrote a book about the European Republic is under construction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very bold vision of revolt. Let's see how this system works. Okay, we already have a few. Let's pick up the first four what there and the three over there. Okay, let's start with you. Can we wait for the wait for the microphone, please? My name is Jakub Bergman. Uh, two economists, MIT economists. Uh, Alessina and Spolaore wrote a book by the uh, title The Size of Nations. Uh, in this book, they examine the formation and change of political borders. And what they say is the following. Um, the optimal size of a country is determined by a cost-benefit trade-off between the benefits of size and the costs of heterogeneity in a large country, per capita costs may be low, but the heterogeneous preferences of a large population make it hard to deliver services and formulate policy. Smaller countries may find it easier to respond to citizen preferences in a democratic way. So here we see that a very large or super nation or post nation uh, country like uh, unified Europe may have, uh, may, may not be optimal. Uh, uh, the example of the United States is very unique because, in historical terms, it, it formed in a way that uh, uh, the, the culture or the, maybe the English culture absorbed all other cultures in, into it. And even though, even so, uh, the uh, different states have a lot of independence. But to take Europe with such diversity and make it into uh, a, a, a European United States is uh, maybe suboptimal. At least this is what uh, the opinion of, of these two economists is. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Gard would be the next. Could you pass it over? Yeah, it seems, seems to be a wait, could you wait for the microphone, please? Yeah. It seems to be a, the, the central feature of the discussion on this subject that we have uh, one side arguing for hallucination and the other side arguing for hallucy Europe. And the truth may be somewhere in the middle. Where exactly in the middle is yet to be determined. Uh, what we have today is a Europe of a union of nations. And all indications are that the peoples of Europe are not willing to give up their special identity uh, and are not, going, uh, not willing to give up their uh, separate uh, constitution as separate nations. 
So against this, we have, uh, we have, you have postulated, some would say that, that that's not a postulate, but the, but the dogma of a, a unified Europe as the <coughs> superior ideal. And um, since most Europeans object to this idea, uh, what we had, what we had here uh, is suspicion of the democratic idea. This is not accidental. If we have to establish the U European Union as an ideal, and most Europeans do not want it, so we have to force them to be free by way other than democratic decisions, say the rule of law, the, uh, the quest for virtue, and other good things that uh, have uh, their own past in uh, political history. Um, and my last question is, why, why stop in Europe? I mean, let's expand it beyond Europe uh, to other countries, uh, the, to the Middle East, to, the, to Africa. I mean, not in Africa. I mean, let's expand Europe as an idea to, to, the, whole world. to the whole world, ultimately. I mean, cosmopolitan. Why not the galaxy? The galaxy <laughs> works fine. I mean, if this is an idea, and it's a cosmopolitan idea, and it overlooks the clear cultural uh, background of this European Union and of the various European nations, so why not expand it to, the, to its logical conclusion? Okay. Dr. Boloxi again, then. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Actually, after the remarks by Professor Gad, there is not, uh, not much that I could add. The only thing I wanted to say is that, actually, surprisingly, I do agree with 95% of your sentiment. Mm -hmm. And 95. 95. And uh, I, I really sympathize with the revolutionary liberal centrism that you promote. Uh, um, but uh, the, uh, the problem with this is that this idea that in order to build really liberal and democratic European Union, you need a European nation, is an old idea. It's, it's uh, been floated for several decades, as far as I remember. All people speak about it, and it wasn't done. And it seems to me it wasn't done not because people couldn't understand that, but because it was probably Im impossible to do that. Once you have very sophisticated, developed high cultures of different sorts, people won't give up on their high cultural, different high cultural uh, uh, identities. So, uh, if, if uh, you, simple, many co uh, simple people in Europe, they don't speak English. That's right. So, uh, in the sense, Israel is much better candidate for uh, developing European identity because most of Israeli population do speak English much better than Italians or or uh, like uh, Spanish uh, or whomever ever, ever. So, in this sense radical institutional measures of reversing the trend of European Union may be more realistic than the radical transformation of a political community turning it into a kind of European nation which doesn't exist. Okay, we'll catch one more comment and then give Professor Gero the... Ability. Alan Herman, you didn't... I thought the speaker in front of me was going to uh, talk about expansion in a more general way. You didn't expand to the rest of the world, literally. The, the matter of the title of your presentation is what is democracy today? It's not just Europe or Germany, meaning wherever there's democracy, Canada, America, wherever. But the question I want to ask you nevertheless that no speaker today has addressed, and that is why is the rate of voting in democracy so low? And how could the rate of voting be greater? The reasons are not accessibility, there are plenty of hours. There's accessibility to handicap. There's voter education. There is some valid claim of discrimination. That's true. So maybe less than 100%, but between 90 to 100%, there's no reason why. And yet, throughout the world in democracies, the rate of voting is much less. Why is the rate so low? And how could the rate be raised? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's start with the economists. Um, I think I spent 30 minutes to explain why I do not want a European nation state and I do not want a centralized state. 
The whole purpose was to deconstruct the concept of a sovereign state because states are not sovereign. You go back to Jean, Jean Baudin, Les Six Livres de la République, and you end up with Hans Kielsen, which has been quoted by Michael Schäfer. You can do Carl Schmidt, which is uh, problematic to quote, but still, um, the, cit the citizen is sovereign, the citizen delegates power to a state, and the states, uh, perhaps some of you speak German, Kurt Tucholsky, Souveränität geht vom Volker aus und kommt so schnell nicht wieder. Yeah? So uh, the state only has a delegated sovereignty. And here's the thing, um, I, you know, I couldn't do more than 30, sec 30 minutes, but the, 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 the concept what you then end up is that you take away the sort of fictive level of national aggregation within Europe. What I mean is that we could go back, we could, uh, to say the regions, because you were talking of optimal sizes for um, states. Uh, there's Leonard Cohn, a sociologue, who wrote that the optimal size for uh, uh, political entities is somewhere between 8 and 15 million. Why? Because then you think that you have a cousin in government that you can call if something does not work for you. Yeah, you c And it's enough that you think that. You do not need, even need to have that cousin. But what it <coughs> makes is that you do not feel governed by Washington or by Moscow or by Berlin or by Paris. So the idea is that if you, de because if you take a look of uh, the Eurozone or Europe, the problem is that we have big, three big elephants in the room, and the elephants are Germany, UK, and France, and the other are smaller countries. So what we are playing systemically in Europe is animal farms. Some animals are e more equal than others, especially the Germans. Yeah, and and on an animal farm logic, you cannot run a political entity. Yeah, that is why I was claiming for political e equality. But that claim does not need to be a centralized superstate. It could go back to the regions, which are the institutional carriers of a government system, which we could sketch out. But the sense to understand is that the citizens are sovereign and not the nation states, and that the nation state is the, the European <coughs> making then is from citizens and regions with a republican roof that secures the political equality. Obviously, you would need some fiscal clips like you have them in the US, Medicare, Medicaid, but you do not need to centralize. The, 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 the thing would be to rather decentralize, and if you remember my chart about the industrial clusters, to b give back to the regions um, the power of decentralization, because the argument is that with these clusters, we don't run the Eurozone for long. Yeah. So, and that brings me back to the second sort of question, because Halunzi Nation or Halunzi Europe, I think it's basically tertium datur. That is not the dichotomy. The problem is that we are basically stuck in that dichotomy that is either we have nation states or we have a European state or a European super state or a centralized state. But my claim is tertium dato, which is the third sort of the third way, because I'm not claiming for a European nation state, which covers your identity or that you basically melt down your civic identity or your, uh, your, your whatever cultural identity, the way you eat your soups and so. What I'm claiming for is that we invent a system which offers cultural diversity by having a normative common roof. And the normative common roof is Cicero use equium, which is the roof of res publica, which you could conceptualize. And then you end up in something which rules sketched out this morning, which is normative civic uh, patriotism, which you could have on the European level as an emancipatory process without having a European nation state in the sense of ethnic nation or cultural nation. That is not uh, uh, going to, 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 so that's also your question. That's not going to, to be there. And that's not even a legitimate claim. But to how to organize, and this is possible to organize, that you have different uh, sort of cultural identities under the same normative roof, which necessarily is a republican roof in the sense of res publica and equal law. Europeans that want, is... The Europeans do not want it. No, I, I will come to this. The Europeans want it. What is happening is that the political system of Europe, as sketched out, the trilogy, trilogy, cannot mirror the aggregated wish of the European citizens, which is exactly the problem of Europe. You have a lot of empirical data that 70% in average of Europeans want Europe. They, for instance, want the European unemployment uh, uh, scheme, and so on and so forth. They want the, the, the process of political equality. There is a WZB, a social science uh, center of Berlin study, which tells you that two-thirds of 
European citizens want the principle of political equality in Europe and they want Europe. The problem is that these data cannot be reflected in political, uh, political decision-making just because we do have the European Council and the Council always votes by national cards. So see the refugee crisis, right? You even have data that more than 50% of European citizens are for an opening agenda which is not closure of borders, right? By the way, just this footnote, yeah? But we are always talking Mittelmeer, uh, Mediterranean Sea. Let's remind for a second that Mediterranean Sea in Latin is Mare Nostrum, Unser Meer, right? So all this border protection of, so border protection with policing in, in, in the Mediterranean air would cut us from our cultural background, which is that Mare Nostrum is our common sea. So I do not see anything how we could basically secure the European border along the lines of the offshores of Italy or Greece, which are the same shores where we want to have a bath in, 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 in the summer. I, I think this discussion is completely nonsense. But okay, back to the, the problem of systemic flaws. The problem of today is that the majority of aggregated wishes of European citizens cannot be reflected in the system we have. See, for instance, the Dutch referendum on Ukraine association agreement, which is completely driving us nuts. And it drives to the to the point of the democratic deficit in the European Union. Why the Dutch citizens, and only them, have the right to vote over an EU accession agreement with Ukraine? Either we vote on, as European citizens, and then we vote all together, or the Dutch do not vote. And that is the flip side. The problem is that the Dutch government signed the accession agreement, then the Dutch parliament voted for it, and then you gave it to the people, and the people said no. So either the government represents the people, or this is basically completely bullshitting around. And that is the flaw of the European system, which sort of the aggregated majority of European citizens, if you measure them transnationally, cannot be pinpointed by the system we have. And this is the, and, and you can only deconstruct this if we were to come to considering the Eurozone as an aggregated economy, no longer playing national methodology. There's no such thing like a German export statistics within the Euro, yeah? which is, you don't measure California exports with respect to uh, uh, Ohio exports, and you do not measure H Hessen exports in different to Brandenburg export. So we do need to step out of that national methodology and then we move out of that dichotomy, which is either European nation state or nation states. But the two, anyway, are not the sovereign. Neither Europe is sovereign nor the nation state is sovereign, but the citizens are. And that is also the answer to your question, which we're calling about the European nation state. I give you the end of why don't open it. I argue in my book for opening it, because if I have a, a citizen-based concept of sovereignty, basically I'm in a sort of familiarity with Kant, uh, which is Weltbürger und Jun uh, zum ewigen Frieden, and then what we should be striving for, and I completely agree, is obviously a Weltbürger, Weltbürgertum. So the, I, I think the challenge of the next century is that we get the fact that we need to have something like uh, uh, the principle of equality and the representation as citizens in a global governance system uh, as the next level of global emancipation. Because it's not enough to have a United Nations, which also functions with nation states. It's not to ha enough to have a general assembly. Habermas already called for a global parliament. I know that this may be seeming far ahead but also in the global sense. The citizens are the sovereign, and if you read the kant welt gastrecht formula, which is that every person on earth has the right to be wherever he wants because every person on earth is equal, that is the first sentence of the French Revolution, and it's not by the fact that I'm from Germany that I have a right to tell an Ethiopian who migrants for work that he has not the right to be where I am because the, 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 the soul I am on just because I'm German is first not because uh, I, de I decided to be born as German, but I have no, in, in theory, I have no right to tell an Ethiopian to not migrant for work. How are you going to decide whether there is a citizens, potential citizens vote for your Look, Just, I, I think... Um, I'm very yeah, sorry, but, yeah, but we have, okay, we have no, to no, cut yeah, out yeah, because yeah, yeah, of the... Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Last sentence. I mean, obviously, this is far-reaching thinking, but that's the, that's the, that, the <laughs> charm of theory. Yeah? At, some, at some point, things need to be conceptualized that at least we can go that direction. And I would argue that we do have first signs that we want that global community. There's all this, you know, Negri, the Commonwealth book out there, Chantal Mouffe has been mentioned, Attack 99. I mean, there is a sort of emancipatory sort of global movement. Obviously, 
it's uh, it cannot be there because of lingu of language because of, of many factors that we all know as we do social science why this cannot really emerge but at least to basically give a direction to the global system and to realize that that should be the theoretical work um, uh, as construction workers of that uh, field that is what I'm arguing for so now why do people not vote I think people would actually vote if they had that was my figure of the hearts for recipients if the people had the feeling that their vote would change something they happen to vote the problem especially in Europe is that it's calling crowds you can always vote you have no choice you get the same policy so you can always change your government but you cannot change politics that is what makes people have, uh, abstain from voting and it's by the way the same in the US it's I give you that in America you probably would need to destroy big data and big business you probably have seen the article of uh, mr. page which is the American sociologue who had the data collection because I give you that article but it has been published in the American Journal of Social Science and what he did is he did quantitative research why uh, democracy is not working in the US what he came out with if uh, a democracy is government for the people by the people. He measured for 20 years all the NGO initiatives and he would check whether they came out as a law. And what he found is the only law making were initiatives given by big data or big business that was turned into law but any what grassroots initiatives would do would never become a law. So in, in, in that sense uh, of government by the people for the people you can make the statement and that is what the article does that in that formal theoretical approach the US today is no more a democracy. And so you need to, to work against uh, the stakeholders of the American systems as you need to work against the stakeholders of the European governance system. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. There is an answer. <laughs> yeah. has to be fleshed out. I, I agree. Well, it's a, at least the right settings of questions, but... Okay. Well, thank you again, Professor Giraud. Thank you very much. Thank you.